that's called in the glory land. Hello, this is Larry and Gloria in Nashville, Tennessee with Coffee and Connect. Yes. We plan on having a good time today. You got your coffee? Ready I to have go? my coffee, yes. Huh? And I love my cup that I got from the office. It says, living on caffeine and prayer. That's pretty good. I love that. And boy, <laughs> do I need that. Yeah. Have you ever had one of those days? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Marty, I'm sure you've had one of those days. Have you ever had one of those days you try to please people and things just don't go quite as well as you well? Of course, Isn't that Monday, ministry. Tuesday, Wednesday? <laughs> <laughs> of course, they say, you know, if you're a minister, they put you on a pedestal, you know, and, and you know, nothing can go wrong and you're, you know, whatever. But anyway, you know, no matter how you try to please some people, sometimes it just doesn't work out. I found something I want to read to you, Marty, okay? Okay. And it says, uh, it says, here's a story told by my father who heard it from his father. The moral of the story, the lesson we all need to learn. So it says, an old farmer and his grandson owned a mule called Heine. Things weren't going very well on the farm and the bills were mounting. They decided it'd be best to take Heine to the city to be sold. The old farmer and his grandson started to walk Heine down the road. A woman saw them and shouted, You foolish people, why are you walking when you have a mule you could ride? They decided she had a good point, climbed up on the mule. Down the road, another woman called to them, what fools you are with both of you riding that mule. You'll be exhausted and, and he will drop dead. So the old man climbed off. A little farther down the road, a farmer shouted, You foolish lad making your old grandfather walk while you ride. Aren't you ashamed? The boy climbed off, urged the grandfather to get back on. A short time later, the old woman called out, You foolish man, that poor mule looks as if he's going to drop dead. Get off and carry him a while. Thinking that she had a point, the grandfather dismounted, hoisted the mule onto his back, and headed toward the city. When he came to a bridge, he lost his footing and dropped the mule into the river. And of course, the poor animal drowned. The moral of this story is this. If you try to please everyone, you will lose your hiney. <laughs> <laughs> that's funny <laughs> it really trying to please people we've yes. tried that I, we have yeah and it doesn't work it used to be a song that i remember clear back in the 60s it said why isn't everybody happy anymore anymore, yeah. Yeah, anymore. and sometimes you just wonder but there's something it's a choice yes. it's a choice every day of you know what you know what you really want and you don't have much. You 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 always deal with it good. You well, you got to have a little fun, a little humor. And yeah, you're lucky. I, I I don't use the word lucky very often, but you can say things and get by with them. Where if I saw well, them, yeah, I probably I, I had a guy come out the other day, and I was going to have him clean my chimney in my fireplace. And he says I won't do it. And I says why? And he says I don't have my flu shot. Oh brother, <laughs> oh, that's a bad that's a bad dad. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh yeah, yeah. you got to have fun. You got to yeah. laugh. Well, I tell you, we've had another great week. It's been a busy week. And I know it's busy back there for you, Marnie, and your family and your church. And we had some big things happening. Yes, we did. We lost a, a, a giant of faith. We lost Charles Stanley this last week. Yes, great pastor, preacher. You know, they described Billy Graham as being a uh, prophet yeah. and, a, and, a, and an evangelist. And they described... Charles Stanley as being a teacher and a preacher. And I personally really, really yeah. enjoy it. You know, Larry and I always joke about, and just keep this on the screen for a while. Larry and I joke about on Sunday mornings because we start at 6 30, we watch we watch about five different church programs. So yes. I said we ought to be saved by the time we get out of the house yeah. to go to church. What impressed me about Charles Stanley, you know, you know, you watch your children. And Charles Stanley was one of, they could choose maybe a dozen programs, but he was one of the programs they chose to watch. Yes, because he was basic. He would teach. He would encourage. But what I loved was what? He's always his opportunity to give someone uh, an opportunity to come to Christ. Always. Every single program. And, you know, he was 90 years old, and, and we got to watch a few minutes of his of his funeral on Sunday night uh, that was on, on YouTube. And it was just dynamic. And, you know, he was a very unique man. Not, he did, wasn't, um, 
flawless. You know, he had gone through a divorce. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, and that killed him. He told him, he said, he said he would never be able to be in ministry again. But his, because he touched so many thousands of lives, they wanted him to help lead him. Yeah, but he took those experiences of life and he brought them to the screen. He brought them to the screen. And he was, he was one of these people that he, uh, in fact, here's a picture of his grandson that's in the bottom. His name is Matt Broderson. And uh, I happened to tune him in a little bit last night. And, uh, his, and that's uh, Charles Stanley's grandson. And he's gone through a real, real tough time. And he was sharing how he he said if it hadn't been for his grandpa, he wouldn't be here. Because he said he's struggled in life. He said he struggled with alcohol. He struggled with drugs. Mm -hmm. He struggled with suicide. Didn't want to live. He turned his back on God. Turned away everything that his grandpa taught him and what his family believed. And he said he just went and we say bonkers. Yeah, bonkers, ballistic. Yeah, and he said he just went the total opposite way. And he said he was really going through a tough time. And he was sharing some personal stories about he and his grandpa. And he said he was going through a real tough time, and he just didn't even want to live, didn't want to go on, didn't want to hear nothing about God or anything. And he says, Grandpa Charles called him, and he said, he said, now listen, he said, I want you to know, he says, your mom said you're going through a real tough time. But he said, I want to tell you this. He said, remember, give, always give God another try. Yeah. And he said, when his grandpa said to him, give, try and give God another try. He said, I left California. I headed back to Texas. And I don't know if he ended up in, I don't know if he ended up over here in Atlanta or where, but he said, my, he said, he never judged me. He didn't never put me down, but he said he would encourage me never to give up on God. Right. And that was a lot of his message. Yeah, that is. You know, I don't know if you knew this, but in the late seventies and the early eighties, when I was, uh, I've always been struggling with self, trying to find out who I am, where I fit in, what I should do, what I shouldn't do, when to speak, when not to speak, when to open up, when to zip it shut, you know, and, and I was listening to him and I was reading his books and I was really kind of going through an identity crisis of where do I fit in in ministry? Who am I? What am I supposed to do? And I'd be reading and watching his programs and he was a great inspiration to me. In fact, he had something to do with me starting to write my own book entitled okay. Free at Last. Okay. Because he talked about being free of, of not allowing the world not allowing people, because we do. We allow people because we. if you love the Lord, you want to be a people pleaser. Yeah. And, and you're that way. You are You are a great people pleaser. And, you know, and so each of us try to please people, but you can't please everybody. And I was going through these struggles of just what areas of my, uh, what are my areas of ministry where God really wants yeah. me? And so through this time, uh, reading his books, and he just really gave me some great answers that helps set me free. So I thought that was great. And, you know, uh, I was, um, when I was listening to part of these um, programs last night about Charles Stanley, and they mentioned about him going through a divorce. Mm -hmm. And he, and he had mentioned in an interview, he said, you know, in the early seventies, he said, I was so busy doing ministry. Yeah. He said that I, I lost my own marriage. He said, little did I realize of how much my wife needed me in her, at her time in her life. And we don't understand because men, men go forge forward. Because the women, they do too, believe me. I'm one of them. But when we get to that spot where we are, you, the, the, pastor is, the pastor gets married to be with his wife. Yes. And to be with his family. But he's also married the board. He's married the congregation. He's married the TV audience. He's he's married to the book companies. He has a, and they can't all fit in the bed. Yeah. And she just told him. She said, "You know what? You're just you haven't put me in as a priority." And that's something that you and I have worked at all through the years that we yes. needed to be uh, to stay close to keep that we're is not <clears throat> Larry or Gloria. Well, you started it's that. It's Larry and Gloria. Yeah. But you started that some time ago when you, we used to, 
we didn't have a lot of finance, so we didn't have a lot of time for big vacations or anything like that. So you came up with the idea of taking 15 minute vacations. Yes. It's, it's worth it for the relationship. You know, it's an investment. I, I sent somebody a note last week. I said, thank you for not spending your life in ministry, but thank you for investing your life in ministry. Thank you not, you know, for spending uh, in, in investing in your marriages. And we need to pray for our pastors. We need to pray for our wives. Do you recall in the 80s when we made a trip through, the Cal through California? Mm -hmm. And the battle in the marriages yes. was horrible at that time because we were all taught that we give all and you and your family comes last. Well, you know what? We're going to be questioned first. What did we do with our own? Yes. Yeah, we are. And so what's happening is that, you know, we come across different pastors. We were in one, what was it, in Colorado, I think, where the wife came in one day and she says, she set her suitcase down. He says, what are you doing? He says, um, she said, I'm leaving. He said, why are you leaving? She says, because I'm tired of competing with God for you. Yeah. And, you know, we have to be really careful because that's where Satan would come in. Yes. And uh, I know I mentioned this months ago, months ago, but I remember uh, speaking in North Carolina mm -hmm. and I'd done a big pastor's convention, pastor's wife convention. And uh, and when I got to the airport, um, when I got to the airport, um, I saw this huge group of women, must have been 60, oh, yes. 80 of them, just running down the the Hooping and hollering. Hooping and hollering, carrying on. And I thought, well, they were really, you know, they were really just, <laughs> I don't know what. I didn't know what was going on. So anyway, they kind of caught up. And I said, boy, I said, you all must have been having a great time together. And they said, oh, yes. I said, well, wonderful. And I said, convention, party, retreat, whatever. And they said, oh, it's convention. I said, really? I said, well, who's putting it on? And he said, it's a Satan's convention. The hair stood up on the back of my neck and I said, Satan's convention? She says, yes, it's on prayer. Now get that. Yeah. It's on prayer. And I just, I mean, I just stopped in my tracks and I said, she says, there are 10,000 of us that gathered to pray. And I said, what are you praying for? Get this. Listen, we're praying that the marriages of our pastors and wives and ministry will break up. That's horrible. Do we need to pray for our families? Do we have to understand that the devil is out there? He's out there to kill, steal, and destroy. He's out to get your family. He's out to get my family. He was out to get Charles Stanley's. I mean, look at the prodigals of the great evangelists yeah. and pastors and those who have had tragedies of losing children, yes. you know. And we have to be sure that pray for your pastor, pray for your wife. You know, they need that encouragement. They need to know that somebody really cares because it can be really lonely being a pastor's wife. Pastor is so busy running and going and doing and trying to answer everybody's problems and all this and that. But when she does get some quiet time, she's home. There's a, there is a, it's like a log of loneliness that can just, come in and just literally take them down and you can be accepted by everybody. But you know what? In ministry, I found that I have a lot of wonderful, wonderful friends, but yeah. I need you. I need you yeah. to be my best friend. Yes. And I need that when I get through ministering, when I come in, that you and I are one. One. Yes. And, and that's, you know, and our, our children need to see that. Yes. You know, what are we? I, I like what uh, Charles Stanley's grandson said. He said, when you saw my grandpa, it's who he was. When he was on the stage preaching on the platform or whatever, or if he was off, he was the same. He was kind to everybody. He said, you know, he regretted that he had his priorities. And he lost his marriage. But he said he learned through that a whole new way of life. And that's what we need to learn, yes. you know. You know, it's interesting what you find pastors battling against. Mm -hmm. And sometimes pastors don't even realize, like, remember that over in South Sioux City, we found, we were in the pastor's church 
And he looked at me one day and he says, he says, Larry, he says, I pastored five churches before I ever knew Jesus as my savior. I know. Unbelievable. And I got the, you know what reminded me of reminded me of Nick at night. You know who that is? Nicodemus came to Jesus by night. And he said, Master, we know that you're a teacher come from God, for no man can do the miracles that you do, except God be with him. See, he he could observe he could observe what was going on. Kind of like the thief on the cross. He could see Jesus praying and saying, God, Father, forgive them. Don't don't judge them for what you've done because they know not what they're doing. And so that he could he could feel that, and that leaves an impression. Yes. Yes. And so as Nicodemus and Jesus looked at him and said, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Now, Nicodemus, he's a Pharisee. He's a religious dude. He's way up there in the mm -hmm. He's a ruler of the Jews, the Bible says. And so here he is, but he didn't understand. And I, later, I, as I read the scriptures, you know, I came across the scripture in 1 Corinthians, the second chapter, the 14th verse, and it says, you know what? It says the natural man receives, receive not the things of the spirit. The, the natural, natural man. man can't get the things of the spirit. Gotcha. And why? Because they are spiritually discerned. Whoa, now let's go back. Let's make a trip back to Adam and Eve. And when God says to Adam, he says, if you, in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. And he ate, they ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Well, what happened? They lost the receiver, the spiritual receiver. That's why Jesus says, so Nicodemus says, as I would have asked, how do you get back inside your mom again when you're old? Yeah, yeah. And Jesus says, that which is born of the flesh is flesh. That which is born of the spirit is spirit. Flesh begets flesh. Spirit begets spirit. Mm -hmm. And merely, he's barely, I say, you, got, you have to have that new birth in your life. And that's what the Lundstrom's found when we came to Christ, because I thought it was, uh, I would see churches and see what they do. And I thought a lot of it was just teaching and learning, but I found out it was an experience. Yes, yes. I mean, our lives changed from night to day when we came to Christ. Mm -hmm. It was a wow. And that's what Charles Stanley was doing. He was making plain the way of salvation. There's a, a lot of good preachers out there that are wonderful making their way plain so people can know how to come. So they that, can't miss it. They can't miss it. Simplicity. Simplicity. You know, even Billy Graham, you know, he he remember we went to his evangelistic um oh it was a Louisville, yeah. Kentucky, someplace. Oh, oh, we did one overseas so, too. Yeah. But there was one that we went to Louisville. That's yeah, right. Louisville, Kentucky. And he said he basically had like five how many messages? Well, he had he started with Madison Square Garden. Uh, I believe this is the way he, he said it at that time. He says, I had 30 some, because I was there for a month. Imagine. I had 30 some messages that I preached. And so he says, and after that, he says, it went down to about 15. And he says, now he says, it's about five. And he says, I take pieces of each of those messages and place them together. There's only one story. Mm -hmm. The story is about Lucifer in the Garden of Eden, how he discouraged and stole away the forbidden, got him to eat of the forbidden fruit. And God says, in the day you're going to eat that fruit, he says, you're going to die. And they died spiritually. So how do you get that spirit back in? What, what's the opposite of death? It's birth. Life. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that's why he said you got to be have that second birth, that everlasting birth. And I remember, wow, the night that I found Christ as my personal Savior, everything changed. The next day, the before I was, I was only twelve, but I, I I knew bad words. And the next day, 
those bad words were gone and never have been back. This is so wonderful. That's the experience. And That's then, a true experience. If, if you read in the in the scriptures where it says, "The whosoever's name is written in the Lamb's book of life," that's Revelation twenty one. That if your name is written in the Lamb's book of life, those are the people that are going to be with Christ in heaven. And before he left, he says, "I, I says, I says, I leave, I go to prepare a place for you." And he says, "If I go to prepare a place for you." I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. And whither I go, you know, and the, no, and, Tom, and the way you know, but Thomas says unto him, Lord, we know not whither thou goest, and how can we know the way? And he says, I am the way. Nicodemus was talking to the man that could get him mm -hmm. to him. I am the way, the truth, the and the life. You know, I was thinking about Charles Stanley's grandson, and with so many millions of young people. Mm -hmm. They've been so disillusioned by lies in so many areas of life, be it in any area. Yes. They don't they don't know who to trust. They don't know who to believe. They're looking for truth. Yes. But they're fight they have to realize that Jesus is I am the way, the truth. If you find truth, you find life. Yeah. You light find on. the peace. When you turn on light, darkness goes away. Yes, yes. That's why it's so important to for the simplicity of the gospel. And like you said, we have a lot of marvelous pastors out there that are pastoring and they're uh, bringing people to Christ, bringing them to faith. And yet there's those that are searching and looking and they're disillusioned by what they see. Even in some so-called Christians, they say, if you call that a Christian, you know, I don't want any part of it. Or that this is the way they act. This is the way they do at work. This is the way, whatever. Yeah, I don't want any part of it. But Jesus said, I am the way, yes, the truth, the truth and, the and the life. That's the three facts of life. Yes. And that's what we that's why we keep going. That's why we keep sharing. Yeah, that's why we lift up Christ, because as Moses as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up. Because when you lift up Christ, he says, when he's lifted up, he says, I will draw. draw. All men unto myself. Mm -hmm. That is the that's the unseen altar call right there. That's the unseen altar call because you feel that drawing, that pulling, that sensation. I felt the night I heard the gospel. I felt so horrible. I felt so unworthy. I felt I wanted to crawl down under the pew. I just felt horrible, but so relieved. Once I had received him, I passed from the spiritual death unto spiritual life. Because what Adam and Eve had set the zero in the Garden of Eden, Jesus set the life again. And by coming into my heart. You know, Jesus makes the Holy Spirit is gentle. Yes. Yet he's powerful. And he's an interpreter. Yes. And I was just thinking back to when we were in Colorado many, many years ago. And when the altar call was given, there were dozens and dozens that responded to the altar call. But one, one couple came up and they, I can't remember what country they were from. Oh, wait a minute, that was Colorado? Yeah, yes. And, they, and, and when you came and they came up and they, she said she couldn't, how was she, it? She said, she didn't understand one word of English. But she felt the pull, yeah, the pull to come forward and she felt the presence of God. And she was, and those that spoke her language, because I think it was Spanish, mm -hmm. those that knew the language there talked to her and she says, I felt something, I had to go. I didn't know what it was, but I had to go. That's, and that's what it's all about. It's the pull. Yes. And and Jesus loves us. He's you know, he's so patient and we make we all make mistakes, we all mess up, but aren't you thankful for a God who is forgiving? That he doesn't say, I'm done with you, you're done, I'm over it, my patience is gone. You know, we sometimes get impatient with each other or our children or with other people, but he's ever forgiving. I always every morning, I, almost every morning. I, I hum to myself, great is thy faithfulness. Yes. Just you mercy. You a lot in the morning. <laughs> I do. It's a good way to get going. <laughs> as long as I sing to myself. <laughs> no, you're all right. 
<laughs> but I, I just, I, and I do always pray, say, God, keep a song in my heart. Let it be just, you know, the worship, because that, that sets the pace for your day. When you get up and it's how you start your day with the Lord, start in the word. You know, I just encourage you. It has to be a habit. And it's, it's, it's work. There's sometimes it's work. You, sometimes you're really tired, you know, and it's hard to get up. But I want to be up before my kids are up. I want to be up before they are getting dressed and heading off to work. I want to be up before my grandkids are up. I want to be up before my little great grandkids are up and they're up earlier than everybody else. And I want to pray the blessing. I want to pray the blood over yes. them that yes. God will do that. And that through the day, God will bless them. He will, he will be there and, uh, and that he will make them successful. He will make them think about that. They will just think about spiritual things of how they really, really need God because this life is really short and it's winding and it's winding and we're going to need all of them that we can get. Yeah, we're losing some of these people like Charles Stanley. We're going to need some, those that can go out there and start up another, yes, another group. Yes. You know what I love? I love seeing, uh, you get two sides. You see the the revival that has been taking place yeah. and is and it's it is not coming it's here for all those who participate in it and uh in fact i was talking with marnie and uh they had a lot of churches yesterday had youth services where all their youth did all their programs yeah. and so they did the worship they did you know they took the offering they did led the singing and then they had one of their own it, bring a message and that's what's going to change people because we need these youth. You know what? They we always feel they need us and they do, but we need them so we can. Uh, they grow us, yes. and yeah. you know they can kind of put us to shame because they've got such a good. You know, with with you now we're going to be. You're going to turn seventy nine, and I'm going to turn. Who said I could? <laughs> I'm going to turn eighty here on June. And so, you know, I kind of looked at, have you ever seen people put money in a, in a parking meter? Yes. And the Bible says we'll get three score in 10 years. Uh huh. And if we have a good run, we'll get four score. Well, my meter is running out of <laughs> money. I need another quarter for my life on earth to go into the meter. I mean, life goes by so quickly, but thank God we don't, spend our life no 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 we've invested we've in. invested in our lives uh, our lives and things and the so neat, neatest thing about that is that god's gifts and callings are without repentance mm -hmm. a few days ago lashawn yeah said they're always concerned about mom and dad you know and they're so good as lashawn ladon and i'm our son -in -law, and all of them they're so wonderful and, and I was just, you know, she said, Mom, you just need to slow down. You're in that office from early morning, from 7 in the morning till 5 and 7 at night. And then you're making phone calls. That. And she says, you just need to just, you know, just, just cut off some stuff. And I said, LaShawn, I am, I am not going to sit in a rocking chair and rot. I am going to invest whatever I can because... For me, the worst thing would be to put me in a chair and make make me sit there. <laughs> and you know what? God has a He has a ministry for every one of us. Just make that phone call every day. You send somebody a text message. Somebody's waiting for somebody to call them to just to encourage well, well, them. This this phone here is your phone, mm -hmm. and uh, I think that thing gets hot during the day because you're talking to everybody on it, and they're calling. Asking for favors or asking for prayer, prayers, asking, prayers, oh, yes. praying for yes. It is, you know, this can be a, a hassle, but it's also a blessing. Yes. But when I'm through the night, I'm ready to put it down and go, night, night, <laughs> see you tomorrow, hear you tomorrow. But isn't it wonderful that we know that, yeah. that we have that opportunity to share Christ with others? Well, this has been great. Marty, I want you to come in and join us. And, uh, Marnie, we are uh, busy, and she's busy at the home office. She is never bored. I tease her, and I'll tell her, I'll say, Marnie, I just want to make sure that you don't get bored. And she says, don't worry. I don't have time to get bored. 
<laughs> you check in. What are you up to? Well, there's a, more than more than enough tasks for today, but that's yes, okay. Yes. I'm glad I'm not twiddling my thumbs. So that's yes, really good. That's good. You know, there was something that you talked about, and 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 you were, you know, you mentioned the the youth. Um, and the services and and seeing them minister and and honestly that was so hopeful for me as i i watched them and and i, I could only imagine that for you guys as well seeing a, a younger generation uh kind of step up to the plate and one of the things that has always stuck in my um heart from your guys's uh ministry and your testimony um because I have been a youth leader and and a, a minister, and so it's it's always something that's challenged me. And it was when you talked about how when you guys first came to Christ, how blessed you were with leaders or the the pastors that really instilled in you a heart of evangelism. Like yes. what they were passionate about is honestly what called you and you became passionate about. And so it's always been a challenge to me as we're training and leading and doing different things. Like what am I passionate about uh, for Christ and what of those things are being instilled then in the next generation? Because as someone uh, in our service recently shared, he, uh, got up and said, hey, we're all dying. <laughs> And we're like, okay, well, that's encouraging. <laughs> but at the same time, the point was, we are dying. We are, like Larry just said, like, like the, the, the trajectory is that, you know, you're, you're going to have less days with each passing day that yes. goes by, you're going to have less days to live on this earth. And so who is coming up as the next generation to carry that baton? And as you shared with, uh, Dr. Charles Stanley's grandson, um, you know, that he, he, his life has been transformed and, and that maybe he, you know, I don't know if he's going to go into ministry, but for sure he's sharing a testimony um, that is going to affect and change people's mm -hmm. lives to come to Christ. And so just the reminder that we all have an opportunity to sow the gospel. Yes. Every yes. single time we have an opportunity. And so let's choose to spend our days uh, yes. sowing the gospel, the good news, uh, whatever opportunity is before us, uh, because we want to we want to bring as many people uh, with yes. us to heaven as we can. And I know yes. that's your guys' heartbeat. Yeah. And, and uh, <laughs> it's been my privilege and honor uh, to have you guys instill that even further in me. So uh -huh. by the end of today, we will have this video uploaded to www.LarryLundstromMinistries.org. Just go ahead and click on the big Coffee and Connect Live banner on the front page. It will take you to all of the CC Live videos. This one will be the first one as it is the most current. And if you would like to share this message, go ahead and click in the top right hand corner, the three dots. It will open up a link and you can share it by text by facebook by whatever way you would like thank you so much for joining us and it's always fun to have marnie you're the threesome yes, yes. <laughs> and we just we, we're praying for you we have requests per requests in our prayer room we're praying every morning uh praying for you praying for your families pray for us yeah. that god will keep keep us strong and that we will be obedient to what God wants us to do and what he wants us to be. Yes. Sometimes when you hear something, you say, you know, I, I know someone that I really would love to ha hear that illustration they use. Or so They can just send it right over, can't yes. they? They yeah. can. So they can. Absolutely. Yep. Yeah. You just go to the uh, way to share it and then they can send it however they'd like. Great. Well, we're looking forward to next week. This one goes by so quickly. Yes. And uh, we're going to have a couple of guests that will be coming up in the next uh, three, four weeks. And you're going to enjoy that. And we're going to have a special Mother's Day deal. And uh, so I just want you to have a wonderful week. Have that cup of coffee. Yes. Take that time of prayer. Let's live a life that when our children and our grandchildren, our great grandchildren and our family look to say, yes, it's real. I want that that lasts forever. Have a great week. God bless you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.
About 50 years ago in South Dakota The Lundstrom's knelt in prayer to God one night There the Savior sent us with a message That we should sing about eternal life We've been rolling down that long, lonesome highway Traveling to help our fellow man And we'll keep traveling on Song until we hear God's call to glory land. We've met a lot of friends in all our travels. We're so blessed. We know their prayers have helped us stay alive. And we're so thankful. So if you ever feel impressed to mention my name, then you know it's my turn to drive. We've been rolling down that long, lonesome highway. Traveling to help our fellow man And we'll keep traveling on Singing happy songs Until we hear God's calling 